So I'm going to tell you today a little bit about the work we've been doing and the work that's growing on the role of gut bacteria in irritable bowel syndrome. This really started about 10 years ago, and at that time we began to discover that IBS patients had excessive bacteria in their small intestine based on breath, breath testing. Breath testing is an indirect measure of bacterial overgrowth, and we were finding that IBS patients had more bacteria in their small intestine based on this test. What this led to is a number of studies looking at antibiotics. The first study was neomycin, but it's really culminated in the study that was published last year in the New England Journal of Medicine, where rifaximin for 14 days resulted in a substantial improvement in IBS compared to placebo in that study. What's interesting in that study, and what we described today, was that 14 days of a course of rifaximin resulted not only in a benefit to IBS patients, but they stayed better for up to three months. As we start to understand more and more about these bacteria, we start to understand that the different type of bacteria that might play a role in IBS. For example, we found that methane-producing bacteria, but they're really not bacteria, they're ancient flora called archaea. And archaea, and specifically Methanobrevibacter smithii, which is the prominent methanogen in the colon, this organism, when prevalent, causes constipation. Now, when we talk about rifaximin and treatment of IBS and treatment of bacterial overgrowth, it's very effective for the hydrogen-producing patient on the breath test, but not as effective for the methane. And we're now using rifaximin and neomycin for 10 days to 14 days to treat that group. The next part of the discovery over this last 10 years is that acute gastroenteritis can trigger IBS. And in fact, it may be based on some data we just published in a mathematical model, the primary trigger of irritable bowel syndrome. In that mathematical model, we suggest that up to 9% of an entire population of humans in the United States, based on the assumptions that are out in the literature, would develop IBS just based on acute gastroenteritis alone, and that's the majority of IBS that we see where the prevalence is between 10 and 15 percent. So based on that, acute gastroenteritis might be the cause of IBS. In some animal work that we described here today, we demonstrated that acute gastroenteritis actually causes bacterial overgrowth. So now we can start to present a puzzle with pieces that fit together. Acute gastroenteritis triggers a change in the gut, gut nerves. This change in gut nerves changes the motility. The change in motility leads to bacterial overgrowth, and the bacterial overgrowth leads to symptoms. Why is this important? It's important because we are now starting to understand a pathophysiologic mechanism and pathway on which to base future therapies. The future therapy will be to address the nerve dysfunction that's causing the overgrowth to begin with and not rely on repeated courses of antibiotics if we can. So I hope this helps to summarize what's going on at DDW this year from the point of view of gut bacteria and IBS.